report in. Red 10 standing by. Red 7 standing by. Red 3 standing by. Red 6 standing by. Red 9 standing by. Red 2 standing by. Red 11 standing by. Red 5 standing by. Lock in for the attack position. Lida really started, um, I think, last year in the summer of 2000 when uh, Nintendo had its new console almost done and we were getting early prototype hardware. And at that point in time, everybody having worked on, on uh, Battle for Naboo, an episode one game um, for the Nintendo 64, um, here at Factor 5 decided, hey, now is the time to do a follow-up um, to our most successful game up to that date, which was um, Rogue Squadron on the Nintendo 64. And uh, GameCube... Um, as the machine wasn't even called at that time, was really perfect for envisioning the Star Wars universe or, or recreating the Star Wars universe, um, especially the classic Star Wars universe, in a way which, which never has been possible before in interactive media. And we set out, we had, we had a 19-day time frame for um, a Japanese trade show called Space World to, to create a teaser version. Um, LucasArts said, yeah, um, you can do it, you've got the hardware, so um, let's give it a try. And Nintendo wanted to present the new hardware there. So um, we brought a fight, first of all, an introduction cutscene, which is on this DVD um, as a teaser trailer, that and a playable uh, version of the uh, Death Star Endurance level, which you can unlock here. We, we brought that together in the 19 days, which was a really stunning proof of concept that you could, on this new machine, GameCube, create games very, very, very quickly with high production values, which was important. And that then basically, over the next half year, while, we're, while we uh, finished uh, Battle for Naboo, led into the real uh, Rogue Leader, which was actually started in February of this year, 2001. Tense moment. Doing fog. One of the main things why we had everything had to work out was basically the time frame. Because usually nowadays huge games like Rogue Leader take 18 to 24 months to produce. And since we wanted to hit launch of the console, we had to get the game done in eight months, which is an insane time frame. But we thought it's possible because we've got a very good core technical team. We knew what GameCube could do. We were one of the first developers in the world to have access to GameCube. And uh, all this, all the support from Nintendo, which was fantastic. I would like to say they are treating me well here. They give me one meal a day. Um, the typical game production for this, which is probably pretty much a prototype for how making a game works, 
um, started in, um, I guess, late December of 2000, where basically the team sat down, or a, a core team sat down. In this case, the mission designers, myself as the director, um, Brett Toasty, the producer, and then various people who wanted to join. And we sat down and tried to flesh out a design. And at that point, really, the planning with the programming team starts. The software engineers or programmers, as we call them, basically sit together and they try to determine, reading through the design, which different parts of the engine have to be done. And we needed something for the um, so-called tile map levels, which works like a puzzle, which is the Death Star, the second Death Star, and, and parts of Bespin um, and the Imperial Academy. And we needed our, a landscape engine, obviously, for the landscapes. We needed space, which is very easy. You don't even need an engine. You need just a sphere with stars on it. At that point, where, where the programmers were pretty convinced that they could do it, our already had, had started. Our lead artist, Paul Topolis, had basically um, pulled everything out of the archives, which was available. Um, some of that material is usable, some of it isn't. So we had one modeler, for example, starting in ant anticipation of the project last year in summer, building really high polygon, very detailed models um, of all of the Star Wars player craft. Um, and Bastian, um, the, um, the modeler who did that, he was working basically during the whole time just on the player craft. And um, so the art asset generation starts at that point. Paul coordinated um, with the other artists and then we, we divided it up um, into strength. So there are certain people like Bastian who are very good about mechanical structures. So he was perfect for, for those models. Or Mario Wagner, um, our art director here, um, he's also very good at, at mechanical structures and these things. Then we've got other people like Armando Afri or um, Corset Paratas who are good at organic structures. So we went through the Star Wars universe and said, okay, what's organic? What do we need organic? And assign it to these people. A story which went through the, um, through the gaming press uh, and the internet, which, which was often told, was that um, we got models from ILM, which isn't true because ILM models usually are done with so-called NURPS, whereas in games we're still working with polygons most of the time, so the NURPS models from ILM uh, wouldn't help us that much because the work to transform them into polygons is quite hefty. The next challenge then, if you're, if you're getting the first art assets um, together and the programmers have created the basis of your engine, at that point, hopefully the mission designers come in. And um, Jamie, Al, Chris and Chris Crawford, our level designers, they basically came in and, and grabbed all the art assets at the time and then in a proprietary tool, which we have been using for years and have developed here, are basically grabbing all of these assets and placing them and they can transform them into a game with the assets which they get from the programmers. So basically if you've got a TIE fighter, they can tell in the tool the TIE fighter to behave in a certain way. That's in a, in a very crude form the description of how you create a game. We certainly were helped by pretty good tools, which we had. Um, one of the main outside tools we were using was Alias Maya, which is one of the big 3D packages, which, which also movie production companies are using, and which was good for a lot of our art. But we also created a lot of our in-house in -house tools. On the sound side, an interesting development was, for the first time, we could do 5.1 full five-channel sound, which only came into existence um, relatively late in the process when we got into contact with Dolby because we did develop the GameCube music system called Musics and in the end we had to um, we had to convince Dolby that it would be possible with their new ProLogic 2 technology to get real five channel sound out of it. So that was one more challenge where in an already tight schedule our programmers had to sit down and really pull it pull it off in the shortest time frame possible. But yeah I think in, in the end um, it, it all came together pretty well.
I've got here with me David Strupinis, who is uh, director of animation here at um, Factor 5 and who did uh, quite a bit of the cutscenes in the game. And uh, Chris Crawford, um, who was a uh, level designer for Ice and Corridor. Let's start out with you, David, because the level is starting out with you. Yeah, well, this was one of my favorite levels for cutscenes, simply because the uh, everything about it is so dramatic and very cool looking. So it was fun to shoot and work with. And uh, it also has, I think, the only piece of comedy in the game, which is the... Uh, the intro where it's kind of the uh, Star Destroyer nose coming over and then uh, the big reveal. Which was taken from, from Star Wars 1, but... Uh, 4. Kind of Star Wars 4. <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> Episode 4, yeah. So in general about cutscenes, how do you do cutscenes? Because obviously they're real-time cutscenes. There's a little bit of video here and there, but how are they done? Well, uh, the process usually starts with a... Uh, Talking with the uh, level designer over what he needs to accomplish with the, uh, the cutscenes, uh, story mechanics of the game, like for this one, craft switching, and then uh, we sit down, talk about what we want to accomplish with the cutscene, and then I, I sit and I play the, the level for a couple of hours and try to get some ideas as to what are cool areas of the level, and uh, we uh, usually storyboard it out or at least make quick like visual notes, and then uh, it's just a simple process of working within Maya. Maya, Maya is a software tool? Yeah, Maya is our 3D application which we do all the uh, artwork in. Yeah. With animation and models and everything like that. How many how many movie um, like tricks are you are you able to use nowadays? Because I mean compared to say N64 or even the Super Nintendo, um, the cutscenes can be much more elaborate obviously. The cutscenes can be a lot more elaborate and uh, we can do we can do some camera tricks, but some of the you know, we're, 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 we're one of the big problems we actually have in, for the cutscenes is things without, without a visual reference in space. Trying to get the sense that the ships are moving, you know, which in uh, both Star Wars and, you know, in the movies, what they would do is they just, you know, move the stars in the background. Mm -hmm. But uh, here, we can't do that. <laughs> because if we, you know, move the star, if we, in order to do that, the, the lighting on the ships change. So we have to figure out tricks there to try to get a sense of the ships moving and, you know, that kind of stuff. But we can do camera cuts, which are, are pretty cool. We can pre pretty much do a, a lot of tricks. The one the one problem, like I said, is uh, it, it's not being able to cheat as much as you want to. Chris, about Ice and Corridor, what's, what's, what's special about the level or what's, what's specific about the level? Well, it's the first level in the game uh, where there's no height map, uh, no ground, that is, to use as a reference for the player. So it's unique in that way. And also, uh, it's the first level to introduce craft switching so that the player can use a different craft craft than the one they started with. Mm -hmm. So had to be kind of careful in that uh, I didn't want to overwhelm the player with uh, too many or or rather too, too deadly uh, enemies in this level. Try to keep them pretty stupid compared to some of the other levels. As for the craft switching thing, the, the way we introduce that is through... One of David's cutscenes, uh, we just show show Wedge switching craft, and hopefully that will explain it pretty well to the player. In terms of the second part, um, how's how's the fog done? In the in the sense of, um, do you actually um, do those clouds, or um, how's it handled for a level designer? Uh, well, the the clouds that you see in in the far distance, those were those are actually paintings done by our lead artist, and and that's basically just a big uh, object in the background that has has those paintings on it. And then as far as the clouds that you actually fly through, that is uh, a, a real volumetric cloud, which I place, it's basically just a big squashed sphere that I place in the level to define the range that the volumetric cloud fills. And then basically, uh, based on based on what the artist puts on it, it, it takes up that, but it does it in 3D. Right, um, correct. So it looks yeah. like, a, like a cloud in 3D. Mm -hmm. yeah. Plus gameplay-wise, um, it's, it's supposed to